Okay, because it's been a few weeks since we've gotten together and got to review this. Within this, we have focused on who wrote the book of Acts. I think you all should know this one. Everybody should know this one by now. Who wrote the book of Acts? Luke. I know. Everybody thinks it's, it's Luke. In the first part of the book of Acts, about chapters 1 through 11, then getting into 12, which is where we're at now, focuses on the ministry of Peter. And then the second half of the book of Acts focuses on the ministry of who knows this? Paul. So we've got Peter and Paul. And we're in this transitional stage here where we've just seen, I'm going to tell you, something exciting happened. Paul got miraculously saved. He was going out to persecute Christians, remember? He was going out to in the towns and in the cities to literally just have them dragged out, killed, put in prison, whatever the case may be. And the Lord met him struck him blind, and yet he had specific instructions given to him that somebody's going to come see him. Somebody's going to come make the way. Somebody's going to talk to him. Now, not only was God speaking in a parallel, like, you know, as a kind of soap opera fashion, well, there's a story going on over here. God's working on somebody else's life over there. Well, while God is telling Paul, hey, somebody is going to come and heal you and touch you, God was speaking to a person over here and says, look, I've got a house that I want you to go to. It's on Straight Street, giving him pretty specific instructions, didn't he? And you're going to go to this house on Straight Street, and when you do, you're going to enter in, and there's going to be a Paul, and he's going to be blind, and I want you to go up, and he's like, wait a minute, is this, is this Saul of Tarsus, the one that's killing everybody? Are you sure you got this right? God gave both of these individuals very specific instructions about how this was going to go down. Man, I'd love to have those kinds of instructions. Often we don't get it just like that, do we? We don't often get the instructions of exactly how it's going to be laid out. But we're going to see that again here within Peter. And you say, how so? I'm glad you asked. We're going to dig into this because as we just watched the video online, of course we're watching the visual Bible online. I'm a very visual learner. It helps me. And I think that you're probably more visual learner than you realize, and I think it'll help you as we go through this. We're going to come to where Peter had just was obedient. We see everybody get well. But something happened at the end of chapter 9 that was overwhelming in itself. After he healed these two individuals, he goes and he resides at a residence. Whose residence does he go and hang out at? Simon who? Simon the Tanner. And of course, in the more commentary, and I made it a little bit funny, was this a dark, conflicted guy that had to stand up or lay down beds? You know, Simon the Tanner, he was always uh, out in the sun and getting all these things. No, it's not the kind of Tanner that we're talking about. He wasn't just bragging on his uh, uh, Panama Jack tan, okay? He had a, uh, he, had, he was a Tanner. What was the job of a Tanner? Tan hides. You ever heard you're going to tan your hide? You know, golly. Uh, a tanner was not a very popular occupation, okay? As I shared with you, for Peter to go and stay at Simon the Tanner's house, whoa, 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 that's taboo, man. You don't do, listen, Peter, I know you're following this Jesus guy, but you're still a good Jewish boy, wouldn't you? You're going to stay at a tanner's house. Now, if you're going to go to a tanner's house, what do you expect to find at a tanner's house, then, if you're down tan hides? What do you expect to find? Dying. Die, dead animals, dead stuff. And that's not really what you're supposed to be hanging out with. You're not supposed to be near dead things for a long time, especially as a priest. And we can go back to that in the Old Testament to hang out with death and dead, dying things. In fact, the occupation of a tanner was so looked down upon that if somebody was engaged, they had been premarital arrangements made, and the bride was to find out that the tanner that, that the one that she was going to be married to was a tanner, she could have that marriage annulled, void. It was so looked down upon to be a tanner, much like that of a pig farmer. If you said this in Jewish culture, you would be like, you'd shriver to think. A tanner? In fact, it's even said with tradition. Man, I, I, I don't like tradition as much as you think. I like history, but not tradition. The tradition was, is that it was said that if you was a tanner, and that was your occupation, you had to live 75 feet away from the rest of the folks in the city. 
you were an outcast. And yet I find it amazing that Simon Peter, you got two Simons here, but Simon Peter, surname Peter, goes to stay at Simon the Tanner's house. He wants to dwell and hang out with you, hang out with him there. Little things like this we often miss in the Bible. Now, while Simon Tanner, let's get this, we got the parallel, you know, um, y'all don't watch soap operas, do you, or did you used to? All right, I don't know. I guess we all got our episodes that we like to watch. But Simon, he's hanging out. He's over here. Keep that in mind, okay? He's at Simon the Tanner's house. All right? Somewhere over across about 30 miles away, there's another story going on. God's working on somebody else. And this guy's name is Cornelius. All right? Now, a lot of information here in verses 1 and 2. If I do some highlighting, and do some underlining, do some circling... You're going to have a whole lot of it right here in verses 1 and 2. So I'm only going to go through verses 24 tonight in a short amount of time. So if we get that part. Let's look at what it says here in verses, the chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Because keep in mind, Simon the Tanner, or Simon Peter is over here at Simon Tanner's house. We're going to go over and check out Cornelius. So there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. A devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. I'm, there's a whole lot of information right here in these first three verses, actually. Now, who is it that we're talking about? We're talking about not just a man. We're talking about a certain man. And this certain man, who was no doubt in Caesarea, he is predominantly Roman. He's predominantly Roman. And, and, and Cornelius, he was a centurion of the Italian band. I think about the Italian band. I wonder what kind of music did they play. It was like when you walk in Fazoli's, it's a big a pizza pie, I am a No, it's not that kind of an Italian band. What is an Italian band? Is literally an Italian regiment. And what is this regiment? Well, let me just see here. Uh, I think y'all are smarter than you probably even realize. But if he is a centurion, he's a Roman soldier, what does that put him in the class or the category of overseeing? A centurion. How many people would this guy be over? I think I heard it. A hundred. You know how we celebrate a century? As a century goes by, that's a hundred years. This man was over a hundred people. This guy's pretty prominent. In fact, if you think of his military rank, he's up in rank, very high. So a centurion is who we're talking about here, but he is of the Italian band. So not just is this kind of a guy being over a hundred, he's over a hundred special individuals. In fact, in my research, I went on to say that there were 32 such Italian cohorts were stationed in different providences of the empires. It's said that the Italian volunteers were the most loyal to Rome. They were the most loyal to the cause. They were the most trustworthy that you could find. I think it's important that sometimes we just gloss over little things like this when we study in the Bible, but to see the specifics that if God took time to make mention of it to heaven in his word, it's probably pretty important. So we see here that he's over a hundred people but there's something unique about this guy. He's a devout man who feared God. Whoa, wait a minute. He's Roman, but he feared God. If he's Roman, he's a Gentile, and yet he gives alms, which means he gives and helps out people. He's a good guy. He's not a bad person. He knows that there's a need and he meets the need. He is, he's not one of the bad guys. He's, he's got the white hat on. He's the good guy in the, in the old western. He's not a bad person. But yet he's Roman. He's a Gentile. He's not somebody that you would think that would be um, worshiping God. In fact, because in Rome, they had many gods. There were multiple gods, Jupiter, uh, Augustus, Mars, Venus. They had all these. But Judaism is devoutly, they're monotheistic, meaning that there is only one God, and that's what we have. We have one God. Now, we believe in the triune, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. 
there is one God and not many gods as most that you might would find worshiping. Now, Cornelius was in the category of the Jews called God-fearers. Now, let me pause on this for a moment because I know some of you, and not all, but some watching even, may be so deeply rooted in tradition that we have found and tried to make ourselves higher up than others of just saying, well, they're second-class Christians. They're, you know, he's a, Jew, he's a Gentile. He's not really a Jew. And yet, even being a Jew that comes into Christianity, you know, I mean, is that better than being a Gentile who comes into Christianity? And trying to have that over, overlapping of weight here of someone that comes into the Jewish faith. Hey, I'm, listen, I'm glad you're a good guy, Cornelius. I'm glad that you are a, a do-gooder. You're wearing a white hat, but you're not, you're not a, um, you, you're not a Jew. You're a Gentile. So keep that in mind as we're talking about the category of people that the Lord's speaking to. Now, this is a guy who prayed always. He was not Jewish, but he practiced timings of, of pra practicing and praying and, and worshiping the one true God. Somewhere, somebody had witnessed to him, and he accepted the belief in God. He was a believer. And that is important to note. That he is a believer and prayed often to God. Look again, verses 3 through 6. God's going to send an angel to him. He's a devout man. He's, he's, uh, he feared God with all his house. So that means his house was God-fearing, which gave him much alms to the people, and he prayed to God always. Verse 4. I'm sorry, verse 3. I'm still in 2. Verse 3. And he saw, now this is who? Who saw? This is Cornelius. He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour, that's 3 p.m., okay? The ninth hour is 3 p.m. of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid. I don't know about you, but I'd probably be afraid too. I don't care if you're a Roman soldier or not. He looked up and there was an angel, and he said, I love this. What is it, Lord? How would you respond? I mean, here he is. He's, he's praying. What would you do right now? If we were praying and all of a sudden an angel appeared, uh, you'd be like, what? <laughs> I, don't, I, would, I would, what? An angel of, uh, I mean, this is amazing. An angel of God coming into him and saying to unto him, Cornelius, verse 4, and when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa. Now who's in Joppa? Who's over in Joppa? Hanging out at a house? Simon. Oh, Simon Peter. Remember I told you over here, Simon Peter's over here. And God's speaking to Cornelius and says, I want you to go over to Joppa. Pretty specific area, isn't it? And call for one Simon. Oh, you must mean Simon the Tanner. No. Whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with Simon the Tanner. Whose house is by the seaside. And he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. You think those are pretty specific instructions of where to go find this cat? Yes. Think about it. I mean, this is God speaking and working on Cornelius while God's speaking and working on Peter. Man, it's, oh, I love this. So let's keep it moving. Verse 7. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, ding, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier. So here we have two of his household guys, which were God feared, and he called a soldier, who I believe, in my opinion, I'm going to give you the more commentary. I always step aside from whenever it's the word of God here and what it says. But I believe that if you were under the authority of someone, you respected the authority of that positioning, and he is saying, I have two god fears here. I'm not saying the soldier was not as well, but he had two that were with him, and he's going to send them to be accompanied by, an, by a guard. And he's going to send them over. So there's three individuals that's on their way over here to Joppa to make contact with him. I love the fact that he said, what is it, Lord? He doesn't hesitate. He's one who takes orders. He doesn't question it. He just says, I'll do it. I'll send them. 
So he goes. So let's keep moving here. And, and then we move on into verses 7 and 8. Cornelius obeys that commandment. He's going to send forth and he's going to send for Peter. And when the angel which spake to Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a, a devout soldier unto them and waited on him continually. So, man, I tell you what, he sent them, but could you imagine the excitement of Cornelius? God, I don't know what you're up to. I don't know who you're having them sent, but he was waiting on them continually. He's excited to see this guy come. He's excited to see this one named Simon Peter. Now, I don't know if he knew who Simon Peter was. I don't know if he'd ever even heard of Simon Peter. But God revealed to him a specific name of a specific place to go and to make this visit. I love that. Verse 8. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. And on the morrow... As they went on their journey, they drew nigh unto the city. Of, uh, uh, unto the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Now that's twelve o'clock noon. Okay, I can get into all the times and I can show you on the clock, but just just note that that is high noon. He goes up on the roof. I don't know why in the world. I guess if he was wanting a tan, I guess you'd go up there at high noon. I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, I keep going back to that, but. In my weird mind, that's just some of the things I think about. But don't just think about him going up every 10. There were very specific time frames that they set aside to pray. And if you remember, even within the story of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, and Daniel, and so forth, remember they had to pray all day long. I just talked to God all day long. Lord, where do you want me to eat? I don't know. What do you want me to eat? I hope it's good to eat. You know, if it's not, take care of me. Well, here he goes up and he's praying. And I want you to see this. So the sixth hour of the day, I've got to keep moving. Now, there's so much I want to show you in details. But he's praying. He's up on this housetop, and he becomes hungry. I told you I was going to get hungry, and I eat before you come. He became not just hungry. He became what? Very. Very. Yeah, you ever been very hungry? Angry. Hangry? Yeah. You ever been hangry? Yeah. I like what it said on the back of the shirt at the uh, one of the restaurants we went to, and it said on the back of their shirt, the waiter and the waitresses. He was he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. Now, let me just pause here for a moment because there's a lot of directions and areas that I could take on this. And as Baptists, we don't often hear the word fast. How many of y'all know what the word fast means? It don't mean quick. What's it mean? Somebody give me a short definition. Not eat. To not just eat, to, but just to abstain. Sustain. I know I don't look like it, but I have. To fast is to do without pleasurable things and so forth. This is a little to to just say I'm not going to eat. I'm going to take time, and I'm I'm just going to fast. I'm going to abstain from this, and I'm going to instead of eating during this time frame, it's not just a diet. Instead of abstaining and taking time away from eating and just saying, I'm on a diet and fasting, no, it's in, in, in a time frame when you would normally eat, I'm going to utilize this time frame right. to pray and spend time with quality time with God. Okay? So here this individual, he goes up there and he becomes hungry. Let's think about where he's staying at. He's staying at a tanner's house. Now, I don't know what he's going to do with the meat and all these other things, but... Um, He's up there and he's hungry. I mean, he may have been looking at some animals. He may have been looking at some things. Uh, didn't you have a slaughterhouse down there by, by you? What, was it's, that a it's process? Still, it's still standing. That old slaughterhouse is still standing back up in there. And I guess the name of that was... Turpin's. Turpin's Country Sausage. Turpin's Country Sausage. Custom Kill. Good gravy. All right. So there was a processing place and all these other things. And we know that this was a tanner, which you did things with hides. They would make garments, bags, coats, clothing, different things like that with the garments of this kind of a tanner. But we also know that here Peter is up there on this rooftop and he becomes hungry. Uh, and in fact, he gets into a trance. Uh, I don't know what, I mean, sometimes I don't function very well like this when I haven't eaten and sometimes I don't function very well when I've eaten too much. Uh, especially with sugar, and I don't make it about me, but sometimes I, I apologize if wherever we're out or I'm eating or we're having a function, I just kind of get in a comatose, and I just kind of just, just kind of observe. And if I sit down on the couch, I'm really observing. <laughs> okay, I, I'm observing the back of my eyelids. He fell into a trance. Okay, what? How does it mean that he fell into a trance here? Um, 
I think Peter was pretty good at falling into a trap. I'm not going to ask how many of y'all fall asleep in your prayer time. You prayed so long that you just fell asleep. He is praying and he falls into a trap. Okay. He's praying up on the roof and he falls asleep. Let's just call it what it is. And he saw here, and as the visions come to him, he saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him that had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and it let down to the earth, wherein were all manners of four-footed beasts of the earth and eat. But Peter said, um, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Uh, let me pause on this here for just a moment because there's so many things I want to share with you. This vision, Peter's up on top of this roof, heat of the day, falls asleep. There's a vision given to him by God and it is a sheet-style substance that is coming down and as this sheet is coming down, it's got all kinds of animals on it. Kosher and non-kosher. Clean and unclean. You say, well, how do you determine what is clean and what, and what is unclean? Well, we see here within what is clean and what is unclean in Levitical law and Levitical uh, Leviticus chapter 11 and then also in Deuteronomy chapter 14 there it lists all the things that Jews were permitted to eat and what they were not permitted to eat now of course in the beginning everybody was vegetarian okay we've studied that when we went through the book of Genesis everybody was vegetarian until after the flood but then after that, God gives laws about what animals you can and what animals you cannot eat. I never will forget a sermon. I can't remember where it was. No, I'm kidding. I never will forget a sermon I heard probably almost 25 years ago. And whether I'm not agreeing with all this theology or these other things, but Perry Stone preached a sermon about 25 years ago. And I'll never forget the title of it, and I'll never forget the topic of it. And it was entitled, It is Illegal to Eat Eagle." Illegal to eat eagle. And I could give a lot of jokes and things that just don't have time for them right now, okay? So, he, he preached this message on what things you can and what things you can't eat and then talking about this passage of Scripture for what is kosher and what's not kosher, what is permittable to eat and what's not permittable to eat. And here what really is happening here, and I just want to get to the context of the message, is that God tells Peter to rise and eat and he says, uh-uh, listen, this is a temptation um, I said rise, kill, and eat. It is permittable to eat these things. Now, what kind of things are there in that? On his my arm. Huge catfish just right there, just all swimming. You know why? Because they don't eat them. They don't eat catfish. But listen, I love catfish. Uh, but Peter never had to taste a catfish. This morning before I came, uh, we made this. He never had bacon. That's bad, ain't it? I don't know about you, but I don't think, I mean, never had bacon. This poor guy, could you imagine? I did something. And I want you to know, yes, you can eat. You can eat lobster. That's a bottom feeder, okay? And I took a health course and all these other things. Well, let me just be real clear, and I'm going to move on from the food part. You can eat shellfish. I don't know if you eat it. Bacon's not good for you. I'll just go ahead and say it. it may taste good, but it's not good for you. So there's reasons why God had said, I want you to separate from these things and not eat them. However, you are permitted to eat these things. Okay? So moving on, um, it's not a sin to eat something like that, but you can eat it. So let's, let me move on here for time's sake. Wow, this is too good and I just don't want to miss it. But Peter says to him, no. How many of y'all are good at telling God No. I don't think that worked. How'd that work out for you? He says, no. Okay, Peter, a little bit of a hard-headed kind of fella. I'm glad we're not of us close like that today. And he says, I, I, I told you to kill an eight. And Peter says, not so, Lord. All right, so he goes on. Listen to verse 15. And the voice spake unto him again the second time. Ooh, he, he said, what God hath cleansed that call not thou common. So he had to tell him the second time. You think Peter's going to get it? Third strike. Verse 16, this was done thrice, meaning the third time, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. You know, I think about thinking in threes. Peter, if you remember, how many times did he deny Jesus? 
three times. I also think about whenever Jesus was resurrected and he came and Peter went back and after Jesus had died, Peter said, I go a fishing. He went back to doing what he used to do. And folks, sometimes we slip and we just don't know and we lose our way and go back. He went back to fishing. He found him and Jesus has got some fish over there. And I, I, I talk about it with a friend of mine, what we're going to eat in heaven and all these other things. And fish is one of those funky things I just that fit in there. Jesus over there, he's got some fish on the grill there. And he says, uh, Peter, do you love me? And as he's looking across that flame, much like he was when he denied him uh, there before a little girl and all these other people and stuff, Peter had denied him. He said, Peter, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know I love you. And he uses different terminology as the word love in the Greek. And he says, Peter, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know I love you. And then Jesus asked him a third time, Peter, do you love me? He said, Lord, why are you doing this to me? You know I love you. And it's a reminder Three, thinking in threes. Peter obviously had to hear something three times. You ever had to tell your kids something more than once? One. That's two. Don't make me get to three. Okay, you can get three. All right. Peter had to get to three here, and then he gets it. Okay? Now, i got to move on because this is too good. This is good stuff, and I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for letting me go on with it. Verse uh, 18. And, uh, oh, wait a minute. Verse 17. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision had been seen it should, uh, should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged therein. <coughs> well, while Peter thought on the vision, now listen, it's not over yet. <coughs> Remember, we got two stories coming together. There's going to be an intersection here. Remember how we had Simon Peter's here? We got those guys coming over from Cornelius that was sent. Here's the intersection time frame. He just had a vision about what you could eat, what you couldn't eat, what I called clean, don't call unclean. And then we see in verse 18, and he called and he asked whether Simon Peter was surnamed Peter were lodged there in verse 19. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit, now what Spirit is this? This is the Holy Spirit, said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down. Why to get down? Because he's on the roof. And go with them. Go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. <laughs> These folks are from you, God. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius, and said, Behold, I am whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, that's a Roman, a just man and one that fears God and of good report among all the nations of the Jews was warned from God by an holy angel and sent the, uh, send for thee in his house to hear words of thee. Now I want to pause on this for a moment because, listen, Peter has fell off the wagon. This good Jewish boy. I mean, I understand he was following this Jesus guy, but he still kept very close to Jewish customs. And now, whoa, 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 he's hanging out at this tanner's house? This is a no-no. He's fixing to eat things that he's not supposed to eat. Peter, what's going on with you? And now he's been told in a vision by God that there's three men. Oh, man, this must be Mark and Andrew and John. I can't wait to see these people. They're Gentiles. I can tell because uh, you're a Roman. And I can try to get them to understand the monotheistic, that the, the God that has been foretold of the Old Testament, that he has come and that he has died and that he's risen again. I'm to be witnessing to the Jews and what in the world are three Gentiles doing here at my doorstep? Just gloss over and we overlook. Because what Peter did is Peter had a choice. Now first of all, I love the faith that the Roman centurion had that whenever the angel and the boy spoke to the centurion, you know what he said? Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. What do you got for me? He was quick. Peter over here, it took him three times to get it. And man, sometimes it takes you and I a few times to get it too. I mean, I'm not quick to jump on bashing on Peter whenever we do the exact same thing. And here, he has a choice to make. And you and I have a choice to make because we get so rooted in tradition. We get so rooted in tradition. Listen, there was nothing in the Bible about staying 75 feet away for a tanner, looking down upon somebody else. This gospel is for everybody. This gospel is for anyone who will hear whosoever. 
I believe that. And I know you do too. So listen to what he says. He says um, in, in verse 22, And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, that feareth God. He's a good report. He, he wants you to come and he wants you to see us. Verse 23, Then called he them and lodged them. On the morrow, Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied them. Now, i, I, I got to pause on this and make sure I tell you about Joppa because <sighs> Peter's really jumped off the wagon here. He would be looked very down upon by his Jewish brethren. You know what he does for these three guys that come? You want me to do what? Okay, I'll I'll go with you. And we'll just have to get together in the morning. Listen, you guys stay outside here. I'm going to go inside. I'm going to sleep in the bed or maybe up on the roof or whatever. But you guys just stay here outside. You can't come in. You can't dwell in my house because you're unclean. You're Gentiles. And we don't mix and match like that. You stay out here, or, or we could have just said, hey, look, there's a little hotel down the road for guys like you. You go on down there. Did you see what Peter does here? He has them stay with him at Simon the Tanner's house. He lodged them. That terminology means lodge, means that he made them feel welcome. He, he made them, I don't know about you, but if you come into my house, uh, I'm going to make you feel welcome. If I don't offer you water, I'm sorry. I just, I wasn't thinking. I want to make you feel welcome when you come. Come in, sit down. He lodged them. Can I get you anything? What would you like? He took care of them. That's a no-no for a Jew to do that for a Gentile. You just don't do that. I, could you imagine the talk? Man, you know what's going on in that house over there? First of all, you got Simon the Tanner. you got a Jew, a uh, follower here and then you got all these Gentiles what kind of ragtag show do you have going on here and folks there's a reason why and I'm going to have to close on this because our time has come I'm thankful that here he is in Joppa and he's willing to go over and meet with this centurion as he's been beckoned to come and beckoned to go you know it was several 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 years had passed from another individual that was in Joppa that was commissioned to go and to warn and to go and to talk and to tell some folks. And that prophet was named Jonah. And if you remember what happened in Joppa, I've been to Joppa. Did you go to Joppa, John? I think I may have asked you all that or not. If you did, there's a big fish even in the middle of the town. I mean, there's a big fish kind of sprinkler thing, you know, like it, you know, kind of like spitting water. And it is right here on the on the bank lines of the Mediterranean. It's a, it's a neat place. And, um, it, it, I mean, can't help but think of Joppa and Jonah and the whale and the veggie tails when I'm sorry. If you've not seen it, don't. It's, it sticks with you. Here, it's so funny. But anyway, with them going into Joppa, Jonah didn't want to go, did he? No. And we see what happened to him. I am so thankful that Peter was a little hard-headed, but we all are sometimes. Yes, yes. And you know what? I just want you to think about this. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to skip on. I told you I had a ton of notes. How will you respond? How is Peter going to respond to this? I mean, you... You're asked to go share the gospel over at a Gentile's home about 30 miles away. And I love how he answers it. Then he invited them in. He's going to lodge them there. And, and we can see the change in Peter's heart in a way that he invites them in. He welcomes them to come in here. And he invites them to sit with them. And, 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 and he's willing to go with them the next day. And yet, here's the big thing about Peter. On the next day, Peter went away with them. Now, Peter reached out in love to his Gentile neighbors in obedience to what God told him to do. Was Peter perfect? And even though he messed up and made some mistakes, Peter wasn't perfect, but Peter was available. And all God's asking for us to be is available. Amen. And if we put down some old traditions and things like this, we can move forward and, right. and, and, and we can get past some of this stuff, but a lot of times we can't get out of our own way True. for traditions and stuff like that. 
Folks, I'm, I, I had some thoughts on this because Peter was not perfect, but yet God chose to use him anyway and to be able to go and to witness to the Gentiles. I want to be very, very clear, and this is going to be the conclusion of the message tonight. And I just, like I say, I had a ton of notes. But I'm afraid even today, we can be guilty of just wanting to witness and to share the gospel with people that look like us, smell like us. Hey, you, man, you'd be a good one to come to our church. Our church? It ain't our church, it's his church. Right. Yes. <laughs> you know what? You'd be somebody that would, I would, we'd like to have you come in here. But let me just ask you this. What if they, um, what if they don't look like you? What if they don't smell like you? What if they, don't talk, what if they didn't hang out at places like you? Jew and Gentile, listen, what God's called clean, let nobody call unclean. Well, wait a minute. They have a different skin tone. Folks, there's only one race, and it's called the human race. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen. Amen. Period. But you know, it wasn't that long ago that you wouldn't have been called affiliating or associating with what we would call other uh, racial aspects, and there's only one race, it's the human race. You mean that they have... Those kind of people that come into church and fellowships and things like that and try to make big deals about that. I'm going to tell you what, even this, the second class putting down that of a Christian, there's no room for it in the house of God and there's no room for it before God because what God's called clean, let no man call unclean. And what sin God has forgiven of any of us, God, God's forgiveness, is if it's good enough for him, can it be good enough for us? And is there anybody that God can't save? No. If they just would be willing to reach out and just say, Lord, would you save me? Right. We're no better just because maybe we were brought up in church or maybe you're because you were in a, 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 a neighborhood or maybe you were from this side of the tracks or that side of the tracks. I just want you to be very, very understanding and very, very clear. Those that God, uh, those that have given their life to the Lord, they are as much saved as you or I. Whether they've committed many sins or just a few sins, sin is sin, and, and God's grace is sufficient for us all. And I, I, I just want you to know this. One of the hardest things, and we could probably go through a whole list of people here tonight, but you know, one of the hardest ones that just seems like, and especially at Baptist Ram, our one, so I can speak to that. But I'm not one like that in the sense of the traditions. But you know what? Those that have unfortunately went through one of the most horrific acts that they may have ever went through, and that may be of a separation from someone who they had been bonded with and the matrimony of marriage and so forth and things, and then life happens and things, there is no room to make them feel any less, even within that, of an inferior, of a, of a brother or a sister in Christ. For we have all done things probably a whole lot farther worse and it's one of the most traumatic events that could ever happen in somebody's life and they ever make somebody feel bad over the, sin, the things of their past there's no room for that we all need to seek the forgiveness of God and we all are in his care and his mercy no matter where you came from whether you're from right here in uh, Nancy whether you're from in the county whether you're from overseas this gospel is to be preached and to proclaim as it was given in the early part of Acts, Acts 1-8, to take it to Jerusalem, Judea, and, and uh, Jerusalem, to both, let me rephrase that, to both Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. This gospel is for everyone. Amen? Amen. That's the message I want to share with you tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, as our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and in reverency to you, Lord, Lord, whether we were brought up in church and under all the religious regimes and all the, all the traditions and things of what we think church and worship is supposed to look like and what it's supposed to be, Lord, I pray that not trying to downplay the things that you have said that are good, but Lord, that we, don't, that we would just get out of our own way and just say, God, let us just see people for who they are for we are just broken sinners who need to hear the salvation and the goodness of Jesus Christ who died for us. And while the comparison is given to that of food, what you call clean, let us not call unclean, to that of people, Lord, brothers and sisters in Christ that have given their life wholeheartedly to you, you love them just as much as you love anyone in this room. And Lord, they have a place right here at Oklahoma to feel welcome. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Guys, I only want